honor for me to be here tonight. Um, thank Brother Clay for that wonderful introduction. We need to subtract some stuff off that sentence. Um, but I do thank God for the opportunity to be here this evening. I'm going to put my Marine Corps voice on in a minute. <laughs> and um, raise the roof. But I'm very happy to be here with you all tonight. And I want to tell you before I get started that God has given me a word for you. Many people have said since they've been in the pulpit today that the crowd's not big. And there's not a lot of people here, but the Bible says that where two or three are gathered together in his name, there shall he be in the midst of them. So when it comes to being enough to have God in your midst, you overqualify. And that's all that really matters, is it not? And so tonight, we'll be going into the word of the Lord. But before I do that, I want to give honor where honor is due. We've already lifted our hands and worshiped our mighty God. He deserves all of that. I want to give honor to our district superintendent and district secretary, Bishop Cunningham and Bishop Michael Blankenship. Special honor to Brother Blankenship for allowing us to be here tonight, to have this rally here tonight. I give honor to Brother Evans, who leads this district as the Sunday School Director and his secretary, Brother Clay, phenomenal men of God. And then I watched her stand up here and give honor to everybody else. And I'm going to take a special moment right now to thank Sister Hines for everything she does for this district, for our seniors. She's a phenomenal woman of God, phenomenal woman of God. What I love about Sister Hines is that the moment I walk into a room that she's in, I can tell she has a walk with God. You ever been around people that you just know that they have a conversation with God on a daily basis? Like you don't even want to cut your eyes at them because you don't want to be smitten <laughs> by God. Sister Hines is a wonderful woman of God and we thank God for her. But the woman that I admire most in this world is the woman who shares her life and her ministry with me on a daily basis. And I thank God for my wonderful wife. I love her with everything that I am. If I say something tonight that steps on your toes, blame her. She won me to God 12 years ago. So, glory to God. Amen. I love you, babe. With that being said, everybody being thanked, everybody being honored, I give honor to you for being here tonight. And let us give God praise. Amen. Hallelujah. He's worthy. You're a worthy God. Thank you, Lord, for showing up tonight. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. And with no further delay, let us go into the Word of God. The book of Joshua, chapter 5, beginning at verse 8, going through verse 12. The book of Joshua, chapter 5, beginning in verse 8, going through verse 12. When you have it, say amen. 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 Because if you don't have your Bible, it's on the screen. And the Word of God says, And it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. Verse 9 says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore the name of that place is called Gilgal unto this day. Verse 10 goes on to say, And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. And they did eat of the old corn. Somebody said of the old corn of the land. And on tomorrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the selfsame day. Verse 12 says, And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna anymore, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Tonight, I want to preach for you, to you from this subject for just a moment. You can't plant old seed in new ground. You can't plant old seed and new ground. Let's lift our hands and talk to the Lord for a moment. Father, in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I worship you. 
I invite you into this place and know that you are here, God. We humbly come before you, O Lord God, asking you to have your way in our lives tonight. Father, I yield myself over to you. I'm asking you, Lord God, to let me step so far into your spirit, God, that I'm not seen or heard, but that you are, Lord Jesus. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. In the matchless name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise as you're seated. Amen, amen, amen. I just want to talk to you tonight. Is that all right? I mean, do I have to do the preaching thing or can I just talk to you? Is that all right? Yeah, everybody said it's okay. We're going to go ahead and do that. I have the mic, so I was going to do it anyway. I just wanted to let you guys have a choice. Feel like you're empowered. Our text tonight comes from a story about Israel not long after the death of Moses. They've wandered the land for 40 years. And God has just brought them to the bank of Jordan and performed a miracle for them. Not only did he cause the river of Jordan to be parted so that they can walk through on dry ground, but he showed them that just as he was with them when Moses was alive, so he would be with them now that Joshua was leading. So being led by Moses' right-hand man, Joshua, the nation is now standing on the land that had been promised to their forefathers, way back with Abraham, Isaac with Jacob. They had just watched God perform this miracle and after walking by and walking over on dry ground they have now pitched their tents and they are camping right next to their miracle. It's not my message tonight but I could preach an entirely different message tonight on the topic of camping by your miracle when you should be walking into your promise. There are some times in our life where God will take us through something, show himself powerful, and instead of trusting and walking with that all-powerful God, we just kind of camp right there. Next to a miracle, but not in the promise. Amen. And so here they are on the banks of the Jordan. And God says to Joshua, I want you to circumcise all the men that are with you now because they've been in the wilderness for so long that all the men who were under the first covenant have died. All the men who had come to God and were living for him had passed away. And now their children have been born. And while they are children of the promise, they're not children of the covenant. I want you to think about that. Because too many apostolics come to church every Sunday, come to church every Wednesday, and they are children of the promise, but they're not children of the covenant. And you, how many people know that just because you're a child of the promise, that does not make you right with God? Amen. Do you know that you have nothing to do with you being of the promise? Think about it. Think about Isaac. Isaac was a promised child. Amen. But it took God to give the promise, his mother and father to receive the promise and have it counted for righteousness. All Isaac had to do was be born. All he had to do was be born. And we're getting into a place in 2019 where we think that we are what we ought to be just because we come to church. Showing up doesn't mean you have a relationship. Covenant is a relationship. Amen. And so the children of Israel are standing on their promised land. Children of the promise. But not children of the covenant. And so as they're standing there, God tells Joshua, circumcise the men so that they may become children of the covenant of God. It's a very important thing to know the difference between the children of, uh, uh, to make sure that you're not just a child of the promise, but you're also a child of the covenant. Because when you talk about the covenant, you talk about something having to change in you. Amen. That's the difference between a promise and a covenant. 
Because now some, you have to do something to show God that you're committed to the relationship that he's offered you. And every time you come into a covenant, it's something that has gonna, it's gonna have to, you're going to have to deny yourself of that has to tell your flesh no. It's something you have to give up. It's recorded in Genesis chapter 17, verses 10 through 14, that God talks to Abraham for the first time about this covenant. He says, this is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of their foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generation. He that is born in your house, don't care if you were born in truth. He that was bought with money, you just work for the church. He that is a stranger, or he that is not thy seed. He that is born in thy house, baptized, born. Receive the Holy Ghost. Who He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised in my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. The Bible continues in verse 14 and says, And the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. And have, he hath broken my covenant. Now I need you to put on your spiritual caps. I need you to understand that circumcision is just not of the flesh. Because we have to be circumcised Jews of the, of the heart. When you come to God and when you live for God, there ought to be some things that you don't do. Not that you don't want to do, but that you refuse to do. In short, God said, every man among you who is eight days old or older, no matter how he came among you, has to be circumcised if he wants to be considered my child in the covenant. He goes on to, have, to give, uh, that, that, that person that is under that covenant has to give up some things. He says it's going to hurt, it's going to be uncomfortable, you're not going to want to do it, but if you want to be in relationship with the holy God, you have to live a holy life. It's a non-negotiable. We have a responsibility to God as his people. He is willing to walk with us in the wilderness, fight in the valley for us, die on a mountaintop for us, but there is something that he requires from you. And that something is that you die out in your flesh. Amen. So in Joshua chapter 5, verse 8, it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people that they abode in their camps, until they were whole. God brought them out of Egypt. God kept them in the wilderness. God fed them with manna and with quail for more than 40 years. But when it came time for circumcision, he left that in their hands. God's not going to come take from you what you shouldn't have. That's your job. He's not going to show up in the middle of the night and knock on your door and say, you shouldn't be binge watching that on Netflix. Yeah. Right. Right. That's your job. Right. He's not going to tell you to turn that music off because that offends me. You can't worship God one minute in this same voice, but then come in the house of God and sing praises to him Amen. when you've been singing stuff that does not bring God glory. Right. Yeah. Amen? Right. I know this is a tough subject, but God told me to talk about this tonight. Amen. And so as they're standing there on the bank, God begins to deal with some things. He wants to give them the promise. He wants to take them into what he's, he, he's set aside for them. But first, they have to give up some things. They have to stop holding on to some stuff. They have to stop doing some things. See, some of you tonight have come in here holding on to some past emotions. There's some depression in the room. There's some guilt, there's some shame in the room. And hear me tonight when I tell you this, you can't bring those seeds into where God wants to take you. Let, let, let's talk about this for a moment. So when we get down to verse 11, if you'll jump down to verse 11 in Joshua chapter 5, listen, listen to what happens here. The Bible says, 
in the book of Joshua, chapter 5, verse 11. You can get it up there for everybody to see. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover. Where did they get corn from? They've been in the wilderness for 40 plus years. It's only one place they could have got corn from. They bought it from Egypt. They carried it for 40 plus years. It was generational. Grandma gave me this corn. Grandma made cornbread with this corn. And if it was good enough for grandma, then it's good enough for me. Ain't nobody coming at your grandma corn. Calm down. Everybody say, oh, he talking about cornbread? Grandma cornbread, the best cornbread. Where they get this corn from all of a sudden? For 40 years, they walking around holding on to seeds from Egypt. Do you understand what Egypt represents? It, it represents the world, sin. They're walking around with a bag of sin seeds. Taking it from a place where they were beaten down in, in slavery. They're bringing seeds of slavery into a promised land. And God stops them on the banks before he ever lets them walk out of the banks. He says, there's something here we have to deal with. Before I can bring you into what, listen, they were going into a promised land that was so bountiful that the people who lived there were giants. It took giants to reap the harvest that God wanted to give them. And they brought seeds thinking they needed to plant a crop. I'm talking to some people who've been trying to plan instead of following after God. Amen. Yes. I know. When we got our plan in place, it gets real tight when Jesus starts messing with stuff. Doesn't it? Yeah, I know where I'm at. Yeah, I'm in it. You know what? Preachers know when they hit something. And I'm all on your toes right now. People was putting their planners in their pocket. Mm -mm. I didn't come here for this. Mm -mm. Lord, I'm on. Mm -mm. This is almost the last quarter. Don't do this to me. <laughs> Listen, they had a plan. They had taken seed from people who wasn't even allowed to go where they were going. You need to understand who's putting seed in your bag. You can't take advice from people who already blew their shot. You... Come on. I'm talking to some people tonight. I'm talking to people that need to be wise. Amen. Don't take relationship advice from people who don't have the relationship that you want. Hey, come on now. If we're going to speak on it, let's speak on it. Amen. Amen. If they bitter, let them keep they bitter corn. I don't like bitter corn. I like sweet corn. You have to give me some. Listen, God, what God has for you is for you. But listen, he's already planted your vineyard. You don't need to be plotting and planning. Because when your plan fail, now you feel like a failure. But your God's plan never fails. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I feel the Lord in this place tonight. Glory to God. Glory to God. You cannot plant old seed in new ground. And they were standing on the banks, and they got a pocket full of old seed. 40-year-old corn. 40-year-old corn. Who trying to plant 40-year-old corn? Don't laugh too hard, because some of y'all been holding on to stuff for 12 years. Yeah. Some of y'all been carrying stuff for 22 years. It may not be 40 yet, but you're close. You're close. What's your corn look like? Amen? Mm-mm. I've been through that before. It ain't going to happen again. I'm going to just put my corn kernel right on over. And if you're not careful, you're going to plant that everywhere you go. And a man shall reap that which he soweth. Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm coming to expose some things tonight. Because God has the seed that's supposed to be planted in your vineyard. But if you start planting 
then it ain't his vineyard. Amen. Amen. And so here they were standing on the banks with all this corn. And the man of God comes and he says, y'all going to all have to give up some stuff in your flesh. It's time to be circumcised. You got to let some stuff go. And one of them looked around and said, you know what? Looking at where we are right now, I don't think we're going to need this corn. I think we need to roast this stuff and just go ahead and eat it. Because if we don't get rid of it here, then we'll find ourselves toiling and laboring in a field over there that God didn't call us to. Amen. I'm talking about your promise. I'm talking about everything that you've been asking God for. He's already got it set aside for you. Man of God was preaching a few weeks ago at, our, at the church, and he said, your faith will go stand next to what God has for you and wait for you to get there. So I'm going to ask some of you tonight, where's your faith? Because if you ain't got none, you ain't going nowhere. Amen. Now, this whole thing, this whole thing is biblical. When we start talking about you, you have to make sure that your flesh is in order, the question always comes back. Look, we preach the word, but then we have to make sure that we give the how so that you can apply it appropriately. Amen. See, what we do as preaching and teaching, it's a very important job because I can come up here and preach fancy and you walk off, oh, that was powerful. But if you don't have the tools to utilize what I just preached, then it was all for nothing. Amen. And so right now, I want to give you how to apply this into your life. Let me break the first myth that God, the devil wants to tell you about God's kingdom, inheriting what God has for you. It ain't going to be easy. It is not going to be easy for you to get what God has for you. It wasn't easy for them to walk in the wilderness for 40 years. Listen, they walked in the wilderness for 40 years about something they didn't have nothing to do with. It wasn't even their generation that was being punished. They just caught in cycles because of what somebody else is doing. Be careful who you attach yourself to. God, there, there are some things that God does bring in your life, but a NASCAR is not one of them. You're not supposed to just be going in circles. And listen to me. And no matter how fast you get around the circle, you're still in the circle. Amen? We're going to need to break out of some cycle. Cyclic thinking. Amen? So God begins to... Work on them, but this is not something unique just to them. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 11, verse um, 11 through 12, Jesus is talking here. He says, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of, of heaven is greater than he. But verse 12, he says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of, of heaven suffereth violence. And the violent take it by force. You can't. Everybody say, well, once you come into God, God takes. No, you got to take some stuff by force. Listen, you, you know why some of us don't get what we want? Because we pushovers in the spirit. We play milly mouth prayers and you can't get what God got for you because you, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord. My, no, you got to take the tile, unbutton the top button and say, God said that this is mine. Devil, take your hand off of my life. I am the victor. I am above and not belief. I am the lender and not the boss. You got to speak some things. Hallelujah. The violent, take it by force. Could you imagine an almighty God sitting on his throne and people kicking his door? He's not offended. You think he's scared? That just tells him you really want this. But when something happens in your life that's outside of your plan and it breaks you emotionally, to the point that you can't breathe, you can't talk, anxiety starts taking over. Your friends don't even know who you are anymore. Everybody's an enemy. Everybody looks suspicious. I don't trust this one and I don't trust that one. And God is like, you can't inherit this. 
with that kind of mentality. You got to be a taker. You got to be a fighter to get what you need in this life. Amen. He's not talking about earthly stuff. He said heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. And I'm telling you right now, that don't mean you have to be screaming at the top of your lungs when you pray. I, the most violent people I know in the, in the spirit will stand in a corner. Yeah. And you don't hear a word that they're saying. Yeah. But, but the spirit world do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There was a young lady by the name of Hannah in the Old Testament. Yep. Man of God thought she was drunk. She was praying so low. But her prayers were moving God so thoroughly, but that when the prophet realized what she was praying about, she got a miracle. It's not about how loud you say it. It's about how fervent you say it. Amen? Timothy. The Apostle Paul, when he was writing to his son in the gospel, Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 7 through 12, he said this. He says, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Verse 8 said, and having food and raiment, let us therefore... Therewith, be content. Continue on, he says, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. He says, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some covet after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows, not because you work, but because you have such a fervent love for money. We know we need money. My mortgage company don't care, care nothing about my, my minister's license in my pocket. But I'm not falling in love with something that's green with a dead man's face on it. That's just not what God has called me for. And I'm surely not going to sell my anointing for it. Amen. Some stuff just ought not be for sale. But then, then after he says all that, he says to, this to Timothy. And this is when he's talking to us. He says, but thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. And then he says something that every one of us needs to listen to. He said, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called. You're called to eternal life. This is what God has called you to. It's your promise. And has professed a good profession before many witnesses. He said, fight. The good fight of, good, good fight of faith. If you're going to make it to heaven, you're going to do it fighting. You're going to do it fighting. Especially in 2019. You got to fight for you, what you believe at the drive through Everybody will debate you about is God is God real? Well, let's look at the let's look at the uh, the historical revel. Well, let's look at my life and look at yours. You believe what you want to believe. If you believe in the Easter Bunny, that's on you. I believe in Jesus. That's what Easter's about. Amen. <clears throat> it was the great Apostle Paul who said of himself, "I die daily." He confessed concerning his own struggles. Men of God and women of God, we have got to get to a place where we stop hiding our weaknesses. You got to be vulnerable to somebody. You can't win everybody because making yourself look like you're perfect. You can't be perfect. It's only one perfect person and you ain't him. You have to let yourself be vulnerable sometimes. Amen. Paul, the great apostle Paul, writes this concerning himself. Romans chapter 7, verse 18 through 25, he says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. If he ain't good, 14 books of the Bible, all them churches he planted, and he ain't good. He said, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. I know what's right, but I don't find the will to do it. 
continuing on, he says, for the good that I would do, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Verse 22 says, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. He says, in my spirit, in my mind, I desire the things of God. But my flesh, it's my flesh that keeps making me do the things that I do. That fight that I've been talking about. Number one person you're going to have to fight, you see him every morning when you brush your teeth. And here's the thing. Your flesh is with you so much that you forget it's your enemy. You you spend a whole lot of time taking care of it, too. You go out and buy the Dove soft soap. Mm. They they, they they say, oh, this is going to make your skin silky smooth. You're like, yeah, that's the one I want right there. Make this. I'm talking about the men. I ain't talking about the ladies. I I remember growing up, man. We were so ashy. It looked like we was playing in ashtrays. I see guys take longer to do their hair now than most ladies do. And and there you are, equipping your most dangerous enemy. In the gym, every day, making your enemy stronger. Ain't opened your Bible in two months, but you ain't going to miss no, no workout. Yeah. Ain't fasted in two years, but you on the keto diet. I'm serious. Your flesh is with you so much that you forget that even when you sleep, it's plotting on you. I'm not lying. You wake up and be embarrassed about some of the stuff you dream about. That's your flesh. It's your flesh all day. And you know what? The world knows it. Because they market to your flesh all day long. All day. Ain't nobody trying to sell you a burger for your soul. No. Chick-fil-A love you, and they get it out in a minute, and they call you, they say thank you and everything. God bless you. Have a great day. But they about that paper. Chick-fil-A will shut down tomorrow if y'all say y'all ain't buying them no more. I'm just being honest. You got to realize that the, the world is marketing to your enemy, to your flesh. It wants to entice you. You know why? Because the devil knows that the Bible says that a man is led away by his own lust. And guess what, ladies? That word man mean mankind. Men ain't the only people struggling with lust. I know we the easy target. Everybody starts going, mm-mm. What do you say? <laughs> Women fall in love. Men fall in lust. That's not us. <laughs> Devil is a lie. I'm going to just say it like I feel it. Is that all right? Yeah. Stop treating Jesus like a side chick. Yeah. Jesus is not your side dude. You, you can't come and spend 30 minutes with him on Sunday morning and then go binge watch filth. You can't go and, and give more time to filth then you give to Jesus. Because if only time you spend with God is on Sunday morning and on Wednesday at the midweek, then he your side, he's your side squeeze. He's not your main squeeze. Amen. Do you understand that everything that I do as a married man is to better her life? I'm not joking. Everything that I do as a man is to make her proud to have my last name. I said, well, you should be trying to please Jesus. No, uh Jesus gave me her. Now, this, this, ain't, this ain't coincidental. Everything that I do, if I found out tomorrow that she had a serious medical need and the job I currently work couldn't support that medical need, Michael's getting a new job. Amen. 
Why am I putting it that way? Because the relationship I have with her is still secondary to the relationship I have with him. And I'm talking to some people who need to learn that right now. I am no good to her if I feel that way about her, but don't feel that way about him. I can't sit back and have more respect for my wife than I have for my God. And when good looking women come up and say, hey, what's your name? None of your business. It's okay for me to say that to them, but when it comes to something I shouldn't be looking at late at night when nobody's watching, I can't say that about Jesus. I'm just, I'm just speaking, amen. It's truth, isn't it? We need to start looking at it the same way. God, you know what God, God says in his word, Jesus says that he's going to have all adulterers thrown in it, and we think that's people who are married who are sleeping with other people. But if, you, if you've been baptized in Jesus' name, then you are his bride. You, you are his bride. And every time that you step out and you're not holy, every time that you click that channel and watch something that's seductive but it's funny, every time you endorse something that God vomits over, you commit an adultery. Every time. Not sometimes. You know, it's going to, the Bible says that in the end times, he's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall what? Prophesy. But it's going to be some that show up to him on that faithful day that said, have I not prophesied in your name? Who are you talking about? Whenever he says he's going to pour out that, that spirit on all flesh, our whole generation stand up. That's my generation. The end time. The Jacob generation, that's us. Well, the same ones he talking about, dad, about, he talking about he's going to send them away because I never knew you. And when he says, depart from me, thou workers of iniquity, for I never knew you, that word knew is the same word that comes in when he says, and Abraham knew his wife, and they did conceive. That means that you called on my name, you had my name, but you were not in covenant with me. You were a child of the promise. But you want a child of the covenant. Right, right. And you left the old world, but you brought some seeds with you. And I gave you a promised land. Running over with milk and honey. Fruit of the land that you did not till. Vineyards that you did not plant. And you took it upon yourself to plant seeds in my garden. And you thought because I let it grow that it was okay. But God said, let the wheat and the tares grow together. And when I come back, I'll separate. But let me tell you something. When you're sowing the wrong thing into your life, it's too late when he comes back and has to separate it for you. It's too late. I'm t I came tonight to get us to look and examine our lives. If there's anything in your life that's growing and the root of it is not in Jesus, I want you to pluck it up tonight. Listen, listen. I didn't say cut it. Because if you cut a weed and you don't get the root, that baby going to grow right back. And they grow back like they mad, don't they? They grow back and grow extra big and extra and it's in your face. You walk out one morning on your way to the cop like, what is this? And they're like, yeah. Yeah, I'm right here. Get your round up. Weeds will take over your life if you don't, you don't pay attention. But in that biblical spiritually too, the Bible says that when a spirit's been cast out of a man and he's sent out and he can't find nowhere else to go, he come back to the same place and this time he brings seven spirits worse than himself. Listen, you got to understand that the devil that you fight is a coward. He ain't never going to fight you one-on-one -on -one in a straight-up battle. That ain't never going to happen. But if depression shows up, then anxiety's coming with it. And if anxiety shows up, then fear is coming with it. And if fear comes up, insecurity is coming with it. And the next thing you know, you started out fighting one devil, and now you got your back against the wall, and you're trying to pick which one to fight, and then you're losing ground over here, and this one is taking you for a run over here, and all you need is to understand, where are the roots? And when you find the roots, get rid of the root. 
some of us are struggling in our prayer lives. But the root is not procrastination. It's bitterness. It's offense. Somebody has offended you. And the Bible says that if you've offended somebody or somebody's offended you or you have ought with a brother, it's best that you go to that brother. Because you bring in your, your, your prayers to God, he won't even receive them until you fix the issue between your brother and you. Amen? Is this okay? <clears throat> the ultimate danger about being a child of promise and not a child of the covenant is that after a while it becomes easy. You see, Esau was a child of promise. Esau had it all. Esau was the for firstborn to the most powerful man on the planet. Isaac had received everything from God. He had two boys. Firstborn was Esau. Esau had the birthright. Esau had the love of his father. Jacob did not. Esau had it all. And then we preach this in a way that is wrong. I'm not coming against any preachers. I'm just saying that it's wrong. We always preach that Esau didn't appreciate what he had. But that's not the case. The Bible says that Esau despised what he had. You can't despise something that you don't know about. This, this is what, what does he mean by despising? Esau was called to have a higher relationship with God than anyone else, and he was uncomfortable with it. But I see all the rest of these people who call themselves Christians, and they do this and that. And why, why the church I go to have to do this and have to do that? Because you're not there. You, you're called to a higher place in God. And Esau despised his birthright. Now, Jacob had been treated bad his whole life so far. His daddy didn't even like him. You know how bad that is? You, come, you got a twin, but you look just like the dude he loved. You know it's bad when you got a twin and they like your twin better than you. It's like, yeah, they look pretty much closely, but you know what? I don't like that one. Jacob, his daddy didn't even like him. His daddy bragged about Esau all the time, didn't say nothing about Jacob. Jacob was at the feet of the man of God, listening. You mean God did that to you? God did that for you, Grandpa? For 15 years, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lived in the same tent. For 15 years before Abraham died. Esau was out becoming a good hunter. Esau was out with Uncle Ishmael. You think God don't have a problem with the people you surround yourself with? Yes, sir. Right. He does. And I know this is not a stand-up and rah-rah sermon, but I'm, talk I'm talking about some stuff you need to listen to. Today. Esau was out with Uncle Ishmael learning how to be a hunter, a man of the field. You can't find one hunter. I'm not trying to stop you from hunting, but you can't find one hunter in the Bible that God liked. I'm serious. It's not because they hunted. It's because they got stuck on themselves being able to provide for themselves. Well, no, hold on. Let, let's put it in a way that's applicable. Remember, you can preach it, but then you got to make it applicable. Right? I'm talking about people who can go out and get good jobs and think they don't need Jesus. I'm talking about your, your, your experience has bumped you from $20 an hour to $40 an hour, and you think you can make it without going to church now. Well, I can't go there now because my tithe is double. That's a lot of money. Bishop likes to pray this prayer. When people say they make too much money to tithe, he say, Lord, take them back where they were so they can tithe and be faithful again. They don't like that prayer. Listen, you, you can't become a provider of everything that you get and think that God's okay with it. He is your provider. He said that he wants to be preeminent in everything in your life. He doesn't want to be one, number one on your list. He wants to be number one in everything on your list. And so when you say, God, my prayer life, I want to be number one in your prayer life. God, on my job, when I pray about my job, Jesus wants to be number one on your job. If you get in a relationship, Jesus 
has to be number one in your relationship. He has to be. Listen, I, I, I live my life like a triangle. When I met my wife, she was here. I was here. She had already begun her walk with God. God's at the pinnacle of this triangle. I had to catch up before I even qualified. I know this ain't fire, but we do this. Guys, I'm talking to you. Don't pursue a woman that you ain't on the same spiritual plane with. If you can't lead her spiritually, listen, I, I'm, not, I'm not joking. And ladies, don't flirt to convert. It don't work. My wife joined the church two years before I did. And when she met me, she said the day she met me, now she has a walk with God. I didn't have a walk with God. I didn't walk with nobody who had a G in their name. Like, what's your name, bro? Gerald. Don't like you. <laughs> nope. You had a G in your name when we weren't friends. Right. Two years, I was, when I say I was lost, I was lost. I could have been in that, that TV show, Lost. I could have lost, lost. <laughs> lost, lost, lost. My wife met me, first day she met me, she said, God told me the first day that I met you that you were my husband. You know what she told God? Nope. <laughs> she, she walked in, she said, God said, mm, that's your husband. She said, no, it isn't. <laughs> I, know, I know the devil is a lie, just, just talking in this building today. Let God be true in every man alive. Anyway. A couple months went by, and I noticed that this young lady didn't curse. So we were in the military. I noticed she didn't, she cringed whenever we talked. Not appropriate. And I, I was the LPO, people who were in the military. I was the head of the clinic, right under the chief. And I said, um, I said, all right, we're not cursing anymore in this department. We're done. If you curse, I'm writing you up. And I wasn't like really living for God, because I also said, if I don't write you up, punch you now. So, you pick. It's your choice. She was fasting, and I didn't even know what fasting was. But I knew she was my responsibility. She was going on watch one night. It was a late watch, and she, she was kind of wobbly. She'd been fasting for a while. And I said, look, I don't know what you're doing. I'm not trying to break into what you do for God. I said, but if you're on watch under me, you're going you're gonna to eat. And I went out and got some orange juice, so she conceded a little bit and said that she would drink something. So I went and got some orange juice, and she drank some orange juice. But I was kind of fascinated. What's going on here? Then she said, hey, will you come to church with me on a Sunday? I said, yeah, I go to church. Now, I made a mistake, and I went to this other church, and I won't say nothing, but it was an other church. Y'all been to other churches. <laughs> like, don't act. Y'all been to other churches. And I went to this church, and this dude was preaching, and he was about my age. And I was impressed by that. I was like, look, this man is being used to God. And I went to this, and I sat there, and every time he said something great, people would get up and go put money on the platform. And I was like, I'm a nice guy, and I ain't never walked outside, and people just left money on my platform. It ain't no money on my steps. So I didn't understand that. And so when you're in church, you got to have an understanding because God does everything in decency and in order. And so I didn't understand this. And so then he said something that lost me. He said, if you drive by my car, and I'm at the time T.I. was real big. He probably still is now. I don't know. But T.I. was big, and I was listening to T.I., and I know I wasn't, in the world. I wasn't living in church. And I had a Chevy with two 15-inch speakers in the back. I was shaking people's windows and laughing at them when they got mad. Um, and I'm listening to T.I., and he said, if you drive by my car and I'm listening to T.I., it's not because I like the music. It's because I'm trying to see what the young people are listening to. And I said, no, nah, I know you lying. <laughs> Hold on. No, I'm serious. You, you know, you can, pull, you can pull that on people who ain't from the street. You can't pull that on folks who are from the street. Come on, man. Come on, I wasn't always in this. Hey, real recognize real. That's what we said. He was lying. But and so when I went to this 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 the church, I was thinking about the other church. And so I already made up my mind. When I walk in here, it's going to be my last time coming in here. I'm just going to come in here because I told her I was going to come. And I walk into this church. 
And this little white haired lady was standing there. And here I am, two time war vet. Walk. Good morning. She said, Good morning, sweetheart. How are you? <laughs> what is this feeling that I'm feeling? Am I comfortable? <laughs> comfortable? I'm not comfortable. No. It's Mama Donna. Those who know Donna Sheely. She said, how are you? I said, I'm doing well. How are you? I stuck my hand. She said, uh-uh, baby. We hug. I said, what is this? Am I hugging? She said, honey, what's your phone number? I gave her my phone number. She said, well, what's your address? I gave her my address. If the lady would have asked for my social security number. I, I, she, what's your credit card number, man? It's 4000. I mean, everything, I just felt comfortable with this woman. We just buried her a couple months ago. She was a mother to me. That day, I started calling her Mama Donna. And she walked me in there, she said, this is where I want you to sit. I said, yes, I'll sit right here. She sat right next to me. And Bishop started preaching. And it's like he had a sniper rifle shooting me in my chest. He said, some of y'all been packing your emotions in, and you don't want to let them out. And I'm like, mm. I said, Mama Donna, do I go put money out there? Like, <laughs> what are we doing? And he just kept preaching. You got anger in you. You got regret in you. And you got fear. You don't want to call it fear, but there's fear in you. And he said, but God has not given us the spirit of fear. And I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm starting to get a little twitchy, and I, and I feel her hand just come over and grab my hand. She said, it's okay, baby. She just never looked at me. She just looked straight. And there I was, 25 years of hurt, pain, regret, doubt, fear, anger. And I had brought all those seeds with me. <coughs> and it didn't matter where God was bringing me that day because I was bringing those seeds with me. But God said, you can't bring old seeds to new ground. And she waited until the altar call. She said, will you go up front with me? And that woman could have took me anywhere. <laughs> and I walked up front with her and I lifted my hands. God filled me with the Holy Ghost. I was baptized that day. That was 12 years ago. She's dead and gone. She's with the Lord. But she told me that day, she said, congratulations, baby. She hugged me. She said, now I'm going to find me a wife. <laughs> <laughs> they plot on you, boy. I'm telling you, they try to anchor you to the church. As <laughs> soon as they get you, they be like, now I'm going to find you a wife. You know, the Bible says, he that finding a wife. And I'm just, yes, ma'am. <laughs> I came here tonight to challenge you. I want to challenge you to examine your life. I want you to look into that bag that you carry. What's in that bag? What have you been carrying for years, for months, for weeks, for days, that if it's planted where God has taken you, you're going to reap a harvest that you don't want to reap? What is it God wants you to give up tonight? Because you're standing on the banks of your promise. But you're not getting access to it because you haven't let some things go. If everybody will stand, musicians, if you'll come back. With every head bowed and every eye closed, Brother Clay, if you'll make your way up here, I want you to lead us in prayer. I'm asking you tonight to turn this entire building into an altar. Listen to me. I've made you laugh a little bit. I hopefully have challenged you a little bit. But right now, I just want you to plug into God. And I want you to ask God to show you what he wants you to turn your back on today. I want you to sincerely ask God. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to give him your word 
that whatever he speaks to you about right now, he cut up himself. That you're going to address it. That you're going to take it out of your life. That you're going to bind it. The Bible says that you need to do some binding and some loosing. And I'm asking you to be transparent with God right now. What is it he's speaking to you about? What is it that you've carried for too long? What is it that has beset you all these years? What is it that's keeping you held hostage on the banks of your promise? What is it that he wants you to let go tonight? Will you lift your hands right now and say, God, I surrender. God, I surrender. God, I give you what you want me to give up. Lord God, we love you, Jesus. Lord God, the word has come forth with power, Lord. Lord, the anointing is in the room. God, begin to do surgery on my heart, Lord God. For this inward man has old seeds that's been planted. It started to take root, Lord God. But tonight, Lord God, you gave us the tools to begin to uproot those seeds, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord God. Help us to begin to take this tool out, Lord God, the word, and begin to dig out those seeds, Lord God, that does not have a purpose in our life, Lord. Those seeds, Lord God, that's in our past, Lord. Those seeds, Lord God, that's not even in our generation, Lord God. The words that have been passed down to us from another generation from people who don't know you today Lord God at this very moment I toss those seeds to the wind and as we begin to toss them God will begin to scorch them and burn them and they will never take root in anyone else again but it's your choice tonight it's your choice tonight. Do you decide to get rid of those, those old past ways? Or are you want to still hang on to some of that? You can't grow with those old seeds. It will only take you so far before they begin to die. They will begin to take you out. But God's word is life. It's new, strong seed. It is here at this altar to begin to give you new life. If you're ready to take out those old seeds in your life, Begin to make your way to the altar. Begin to make your way to the altar. For there's power that's at this altar. You make your decisions by walking down to this altar. That today will be a brand new day. Let's lift our voice strong. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, I toss those old seeds to the wind, Lord God. And I pick up, Lord God, these seeds that you've given me at this altar, Lord. This word that's been planted. Lord, I grab hold to it, Lord Jesus. I begin to read my word, Lord God. And you begin to water this word that's inside of me, Lord Jesus. Lord, let it take root inside of me, Lord God. Lord, they begin to sprout, Lord Jesus, like a mighty tree, Lord God. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Every worship service, Lord God, let it begin to grow. Every time I pray, Lord God, let fruit, Lord God, begin to grow from my limbs, Lord Jesus. Lord, plant, plant me by the rivers of water, Lord God. Lord, make me a mighty oak, Lord Jesus. Yes, that's it. 
begin to pray. Begin to cry out to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For the day is a brand new day. I would not take those old seeds back with me. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord God. Hallelujah, Lord. God is walking up and down these altars. He's beginning to touch each and every one of you. Allow him to pluck those seeds out. Allow him again to, to minister to you. Open up those spiritual ears because he's talking. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me have everybody's attention for one minute. God just dropped something in my spirit. Some seeds can lay dormant for a long time. And there's no evidence that it's there. There was, they were doing an excavation in Israel and they found a seed that was 2,000 years old. It's a true story. You can look this up. It was 2,000 years old and they planted it. And an Israeli, a Judean palm began to grow. And they named it Methuselah. That palm has now seeded another palm. What am I telling you? I'm telling you that there's some stuff in you that right now we're at surface level prayer. But there's some stuff that's deep down in your spirit that you need to get a hold of tonight. Because it may not be the season for it to bloom yet, but if you don't get it out now, then it's going to bloom in the season that it's supposed to. And so I'm asking you right now, no pretty prayers. Dig deep. Get it out. Get to the root of it. Get to the, the base of that thing. Don't let it take root into your spirit. Don't let it take root into your mind, into your personality, into your spiritual life. Right now, in the name of the Lord Jesus. God, I speak right now in the name of the Lord Jesus. Bind every seed right now, God. Expose every seed right now, Jesus. Everything that's hidden. Everything that's deep, God. Don't just move on the surface level, but move into the deep tonight, God. Let an unquenchable fire fall. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God can move the greatest when we just let him get all the way inside you gotta get to the roots of those things that are hand-bugging you from your walk with God those little things like brother Robinson says it starts like a little weed but it becomes a tree it is time to dig up those trees in your life the only person that can do it is you. Hallelujah. The only person can do it is you. Hallelujah. You know, it's not till I really got serious with God and say, God, there's things in me that I'm scared of. There's things that are humbugging my walk with you. Please take it, Lord. Please take it, Lord. Don't let me lose my walk. Don't let me lose my love for you. But you got to be willing to dig up those roots. Nobody else can do it for you. It doesn't matter what it is. If it's stopping your walk with God, if it's hand-bugging you from reaching the ultimate goal, tonight we're telling you, bring it to the altar. This is not the time to be nice. This is not the time to worry about who's looking at you. This is not the time to worry about anything but your walk, your faith, your anointing, your calling. Reach out to him. If you're too weak, it's okay. God is strong. He's a strong and mighty tower. Run into the Lord. 
Run into Jesus. Run into him. A lot of times we say, God, I want this and I want that. But he can't bring it to you if you don't get rid of those trees. If you don't get rid of those things that are stopping you. Tonight the Lord is calling you. He's saying, get rid of it. Come to me. I have great things in store for you. Hallelujah. Great things in store. You want it? You could get it. Hallelujah. There's nothing too hard. Reach. Come on, guys. Dig deep. Dig. Fight that fight. This is not an easy walk. You're not going to win by being just easy. You got to fight. Brother Robinson showed you that scripture. You got to fight for your walk. You got to fight for your anointing. You got to fight for your calling. See, la 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 You know what? When you go to a boxing match and they boxing, they fight. If you fall down, you get back up again and you fight again. You fight again. See, la 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 the enemy is a liar. He makes you think. When I was single, I thought I could do great things for God. But I realized that my greatest testimony was when I was able to just spend time with God. Come on. Come on, guys. You got to go deeper than that. You got to want it more than that. You got to want it more than that. Go deep. Go deep. Go deep. Come on. Take those roots up. Take those roots up. Take those roots up. Hallelujah. Take those roots up. Don't go back home with it. No matter what it is, don't take it back home. Yes. Come. Fight the good fight. 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 War. Fight. 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 See la 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 He didn't know what he was doing when he met you. But only you can fight back. Nobody can do it for you. Your pastor can do it. Your mom, your dad, your friends, they can't do it. You got to fight for yourself. Come on. Come on, guys, reach. Down this Friday night, make it known. I'm fighting that good fight. I'm pulling those roots up. Those roots are not going to be in my life no more. No more. Yes. 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 Let it go. Let it go. That's the way. Let it go. Let it go. You worship, you jump, you praise, whatever it takes, Lord. Whatever it takes, God. We're going to do it, Lord. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes, Lord. We are willing to do it. We are willing to do it, God. No matter what it takes. No matter what we got to give up. No matter what we got to give up, Lord. No matter what we got to give up. You are well worth it. You are well worth it, Lord. Come on, 
The enemy didn't know. The enemy didn't know when he tried to attack you what you were going to do to him. You got power. You got power. Power. Hallelujah. second I'm walking here and I'm talking and the Lord is just downloading he just is showing me you know when we are at school or wherever we were we were growing up and we were fighting we didn't just like if somebody was attacking you or trying to take your stuff you didn't just give it to them did you did you let them come to your house and take whatever it is no so why are we letting the enemy think that he has a bigger hole in our lives than our God? Why? He's telling lies to the singles. He's telling lies to everybody, but especially the singles. Because he tries to make you feel like you can't do great things. That there's nothing left for you. But I'm a living testimony that my God could do great things while you're single. And then he backs it up when he's finished. But you know what? And like Brother Robinson said, I'm very transparent because I've learned that that is my greatest testimony. When I was fighting and I did not want to do this anymore. And when I wanted to go to the world and I see things, one day I made up my mind. I walked on the beach for 30 days in a row and say, God, I am weak. God, I am weak. You're going to have to help me. I want to leave church. I want to go here. I want to do this. You see what I learned? If you are not afraid to be honest with God, because he already knows, you're only hiding from yourself. But when you speak it, and say, God, these are the things that are keeping me back from walking with you. These are the things that are keeping my anointing down. Then he says, okay, come here, baby. Because, you know, we have a loving God. Then he starts ministering. And in those 30 days, I walked. And I walked on that beach. And I said, God, everything that's not of you, please take it. I'm so scared to lose my walk with you. I'm about to lose everything that I fought for. Everything I want. Everything. And the Lord said, no, you're not. You know why? Because if I'm with you, you're going to be okay. If I'm with you, you're going to be okay. But the first step in any healing, and Sister Miranda, I don't know why you just came to my mind. Because when I was growing up, I didn't think it was okay to say I was hurting. I didn't think it was okay to say I had an issue. I was brought up to be strong. And everything I went through, I showed the strength. But then when I started really leaning on God, he says, where are you are weak, I'm strong. He says, if you just give it to me, I'll help you. Because some things, guys, we can't fix on our own. We can't. This flesh is so evil. It's evil. So tonight, before you walk anywhere or do anything, you need to come to the altar like you are now, but you need to tell God what you're struggling with, not your friend. And let me tell you, if anybody's listening to anybody else, that's between you and God. Because right now is not the time to be judging anyone. Now is not the time to make anybody feel uncomfortable. Everybody's eyes should be shut and everybody should be going to the Lord. Like he said, tonight is the night to dig up the ground. Now, if you want to take it back with you, that's fine. Because you know the Lord is a gentleman. He's never going to force you to give up something you don't want. But anything you are allowed to grow, 
and it's not of God will take you over. One of the things we do as saints is we feel we're so strong. No, you're not. We're not. We're strong with the Lord, but not on our own. Not on our own. So there's things that you're not going to be able to fight. There's things you're not going to be able to bring down unless you go to God for it. So he preached an amazing message. But now it's your turn. So I am going to let you for the next couple minutes. This is between you and God. Please don't take it back home. If you want change in your life, if you want to see the blessings of God roll down, you have to be willing to make room. You have to dig out the things that are not of God so he can point the things that are of God. But everything starts with you. So they're going to play some more music. And I want, for the next couple minutes, it's just going to be between you and God before we end. Thank you, guys. Let's close our eyes. Let's not be looking at anybody. This is your time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's start praying. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on. Bring it to the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. We just thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Jesus, your faithful God. Hallelujah, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord, you know, Lord, 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 yes. Come on. Hallelujah, Jesus. Breach slow. Come on, dig deep. Hallelujah, take those shovels out. Dig those roots out. See lo 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 yes. Hallelujah, tia lo 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 yes. Tia lo 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 yes. Tia lo 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 Yes, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, minister God. Hallelujah, Jesus, right now, God. Search me, God. Anything that's not of you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, your presence is here. Oh, Lord, we thank you for your presence, God. We thank you for your powerful working power, God. Yes, yes. 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 Y
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Tonight, before we dismiss, when you go home tonight, I want you to write down. Don't just say it. I want you to write down somewhere where you can trust that it's only you and God what you're struggling with. You see, when you write it down, you're going to expose it. And when you expose it, then God is right there to help you work through it. Because if you only think about it, there's so much going on in our minds. There's so many things that are coming against us. There's so many daily lives. There's so many things we have to do that sometimes we get overwhelmed. But if you wrote it down, if you write it down and you use it in your prayer time, guess what's going to happen? It will change, right? Persistent prayers, right? You cannot fight some of the stuff you're fighting by just saying it sometimes. You got to look it dead in the eye and say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Get behind me. So don't just leave tonight. The thing that I know for a fact about God is he doesn't do anything by accident. This date was changed three times. Three times the date was changed because God had a purpose of doing this. He doesn't make any mistakes. The thing about it is, what do we do with what he's given us? If you do the same thing that you did before you came, you will get the same results. So today, you got to make up your mind to do something different. See, the Lord is so amazing. He's just waiting on us. A lot of times when we pray, we think it's God, but it's not God. He's waiting on us to make a move. He's making on us to rebuke those things. He's waiting on us to fight back. In these last days, if you can't fight, you might as well sit down. You're going to have to fight for everything every single thing and your walk with God is going to be the thing you're going to have to fight for the most you know and I will sh I will sorry put her on a uh, uh, no call her out she probably didn't know that but this is one of my co-workers Tara from Target and I'm so honored that she came because every day she sees me fighting right Every day I go in, I go to a war zone. But you know what I made up my mind? This walk ain't to play with. You can play with anything else, but you're never going to get me to compromise my walk. You're never going to let me make me give up my walk. And you know what? I got a big God. I have a fighting God that got my back. I don't know about you. I don't know about you, because if you have a fight in God, you will fight back. Don't let the enemy keep playing these things and these tricks on your mind. He's a liar from the pit of hell. Every time I get excited, he's trying to stop my throat, but he's a liar. I'm going to call him a liar. You guys are fighters. Let's not just sit in a corner. And let him feel like he got us up against our back. Is he crazy? Does he know who we are? We can move mountains. We can change destinies. And yet still, we walk around. When I'm the least effective is when I walk around with my head down. 
Anytime I let the enemy get in my mind and my spirit, all of a sudden I feel like a failure. I'm not a failure. That's not what the word of God said. But see, especially while you're single, he tries to do that. He tries to bring up all of the things that are, you know, oh, I messed up here, I do that. Oh man, go take a seat somewhere. Take a seat. You were kicked out and you're going down and you're never coming back up. At least I got a hope. I got a hope. You got a hope. Don't go home and let the enemy play with your mind. Write it down. I promise you. Last year I stood right here and I said, some of you all are going to be married next year. And people were looking at me like, yeah. One person said, yeah, I want to be married. I won't call her name. She ran from the back to the front. She's married. She's married. I know about three more people that got married. But it's not about the marriage. That'll come. It's about what you want from God. And did you write it down and did you claim it? You got to claim it. But see, you got to make sure you're right with God before you claim something. Because you don't want a husband if you don't know how to be submissive. You don't want a wife if you can't take care of one. So when you get yourself ready, guess what God does? He brings that person. Sometimes I, there was somebody I texted today and I said, you know, I hate the word singles. Because everybody always make it seem like it's a bad word. Oh, you know, we got to go to a singles rally. Oh, Lord, I'm about to die. That means it's a hookup. Let me tell you something. I made up my mind. Any rally I go to, it's me and Jesus. Whoever else wants to show up, that's their problem. But I'm going to go get what is mine. I'm going to go get what is mine. So tonight is about getting what is yours. Don't worry about all the other stuff. Did he say he's not going to add? Did he say he's going to add? Is there a way in the Bible that it said that he was going to add? I mean, we act like we, we serve like some God that doesn't keep promises. Oh, Lord, I'm still single. Oh, Lord, nobody likes me. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, this. Like, Really? You are a prize to him. Royalty. Do you carry yourself like royalty and do you think you're royalty? Anything good is worth waiting for. So if you are not married or you don't have somebody, it's okay. Because you're a good thing. So you're worth waiting for. So just wait on God. But do me a favor. I want you guys to write it up, write it down, what you're digging up tonight. Because next year, God willing, I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask. Because I know my God is a promise keeper. I know he is. And if you take it to him, he's going to help you get over it. He's going to help you remove it. So we are going to put God I'm putting you on notice. We are writing it down tonight. We are going to write it down and we're going to pray about it. And we will see you move and do marvelous things in the coming year. Everyone, thank you for coming. I hope you had a wonderful